Welcome to episode 12 of Antlia. The warfare situation is getting a little bit confusing in this game, though the bump situation is not. There's a, there's a couple of bumps coming up. Ermor has had an expansion battle in Gnome Peaks. He's got almost 20 equites with two archbishops here. I'm imagining that the locals aren't too happy to see this. <laughs> Damn. Quick and tidy. And Ermor claimed the throne this turn. He's the first player to get a hold of a throne in this game. Crystal throne, super good throne, primarily because of this mage recruitment right here. Not quite as good as the mages that Caleb is getting in the other game, but still excellent cross path, and this is his best earth that he'll be getting. And as for Ermor's turn though, like it kind of looks like a stale, but it isn't actually. He's searching here, uh, he's researching with a fresh recruit. I guess he's just either not moving units or he did it at the last minute and I didn't get it in the turn file. Yeah, he's building a palisades here too. He started this this turn, so he's doing some things. Maybe he's just chilling. But this is kind of funny here. These His mercenaries are diseased. I think there's a disease site on this province, almost certainly a disease site on this province, which really sucks because these, uh, these mages have old age. So he'd probably have to recruit them here and then shuffle them to his capital or something like that. But I was just discussing this with someone yesterday, someone in this game actually, he said that if you have a mercenary commander and they get diseased and they die on top of one of your labs, you'll get all of the items that they have. Now, I haven't tested this myself, but if you wanted to uh, to keep bidding on Fritioff's archers, and mercenaries here. Until the guy dies, he could get a hold of that clam of pearls. I'm not sure if it's worth all the gold, but these aren't very easy for him to build. And it's a very useful item. Oh, he's got the assassins coming over here. I love seeing that. And Katis is talking to Oceania. Oh man, it looks like Oceania and Katis want to uh, team up on Fomoria too. Damn. Katis has found a magic site this turn. A really, really good magic site actually. This one's incredible. Like 100 supply points, fine. Though, you know, I could also help people who are invading you. A nature gem, great, but this, the enchantress. This is an absolutely incredible mage. Enormous break far into nature, as well as a decent run into every single elemental path. Katis is getting a lot of good nature independence in this game. You know, he already has the uh, the animist over here, which isn't entirely helpful to him as he already has, you know, decent nature at N2. But this here, if he decides to build here, he is secured in N3, could possibly get N4. It's not entirely unrealistic. I think 4% of these are N4, though well, I'm not very good at math, so don't quote me on it. And he's moving a lot of units down to these barbarians again. This is the third attempt on this barbarian province. Uh, this time I'm thinking he's probably bringing it up to take the province, though this script, he might end up with some losses. I don't think having the chariots meet the barbarians first is necessarily a good thing. I think something a little more similar to like an elephant script would, uh, would be a little more ideal. I don't know, something like something like this. But uh, this is long awaited for Katis. Uh, hopefully he beats Agartha to the punch because Agartha does have some units in the region and I don't think they have anywhere else to go. Agartha has received a message from Yomi. Yomi is talking about his bump with Vanheim and is sharing Vanheim's bless with Agartha and is requesting support in a war against Fomoria. Again, Agartha's had a couple of expansion battles. The one in Resena went very predictably. We'll go ahead and check out the one in Dubros as this is a troglodyte lord province and these are just awesome. This guy's getting a, a lot of experience. He's getting pretty fat. Let's watch him rip through these suckers. Bam, 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 crunch, crunch, crunch. Man. What a monster, he just ate up all of those heavy infantry. And just just like usual, he falls asleep right at the very end. Kinda of crazy how that keeps happening. Like he has just enough fatigue to take out these provinces. Handles the province just fine by itself. And Agartha's Pretender has awoken this turn. Uh, it is a Oracle of the Deep. Air 4, Earth 4, Astro 4, and little splash of death. And looks like she is immediately taking out to do some sight searching with it. Here in Anasia, that is definitely a sight searching script. <laughs> and this is pretty cool. Uh, moving into Midria, so we're actually going to see a pretty decently sized bump here between Agartha and Katis. One that's a, a little bit hard to predict. I'm, I'm really terrified of these things. But Katis is bringing a decent amount of stuff to this fight. And Agartha's also moving down here into Embracer with actually a fairly sizable army. Oceania was moving this direction with a line of Iktitars, so there's a very good chance I think that we'll be seeing a bump here too. Agartha did just reach Conjuration 3 this turn and she's instantly casting Bitharis Pack. This is a spell that pops up an earth elemental and now she's focusing on construction and then some enchantment and thaumaturgy. I'm imagining that the enchantment might be for Twiceborn which went through some changes recently. Uh, she might also be looking at Terracotta Army though I'm not sure. I'm not enormously familiar with playing EA Agartha. I don't know if there's better things to do with fire gems with some of their national spells. Also a neat event here in the Silver Wall. Some kid walked out of the woods, saw the local governor as a big man. I will fight for you. 
I run like the stag and fight like the forest lion. What a badass. Let's check him out here. Steely Dan. Okay. Instantly renamed. Nope. Oh, free commander. Nothing to complain about. But yeah, Gartha's going to have a lot of action in the next turn. I don't, I don't think she has any way of expecting that it's coming out of, though, you know, this move right here. This is aggressive. Like, if I was the only water nation in a game and this is what my pawn looked like, I would not allow anyone else to be into it. They'd have to, they'd have to beat me up really bad to have any provinces in my pond. So I consider moves like this one, like, as, as a straight up aggression toward Oceania. But Agartha might feel differently. Oceania might feel differently. We'll just have to wait and see. Uh, Fomoria, who seems to have a target on his back, is receiving a lot of messages from people who are discussing attacking him. Uh, Katis inquiring about a non-aggression pact, but is kind of confused about what it is. I think that making it now ends in a few turns from now is usually not how non-aggression pacts work. It's someone will declare that their non-aggression pact is ending in three turns at some point in an app three, and then it ends three turns from that point. But yeah, big confusing mess naps, at least in my opinion. Uh, Agartha is in the process of discussing a non-aggression pact with Fomoria. I know that one. That's ACDC. Uh, Yomi's telling Fomoria that he's gonna attack Shibalba and that they're He's like uh, proposing an alliance. I don't believe Yomi here. Man, this shit, this shit is confusing. I think Fomoria has done a good job of muddying up the waters. Whether or not he's aware that Yomi and Shababa were talking about teaming up on him, his messages have, I think, delayed invasion. And Shababa just giving him a little nod. Fomoria has found a magic site this turn. Sparkling fields, some air gems, which are, I think, among the most important gems for Fomoria, maybe behind death gems. Though depending on the Fomorian strategy, water gems might also be really important. I don't think he's going for that strategy in this game, though. He did just reach Conjuration 3, which was a goal because he's now switching over to Evocation, but I don't see him doing anything with it on this turn, so I'm presuming that he's just, you know, getting his basic research goals out of the way in preparation for potential fight. Derg, what kind of name is that? And he's starting to recruit for Morian Kings, which is really awesome. He'll soon have his Palisades up here in Coast Haven, and he started another one here on the Yellow Mountains, which is, I think, really important to secure the Steel Ovens here. By far one of his most important provinces, though he still does have yet to build a Palisades on what I also consider to be one of his other most important provinces. Where he is recruiting, <laughs> he's recruiting Lizard Warriors even. I think that suggests to me that he is preparing for some kind of invasion in this direction. So I think Fomoria might be serious when he's proposing alliances, though I'm not sure exactly who he wants to ally with in this triangle either. Really, really confusing. Not a whole lot going on with Vanheim's messages, just a little message from Yomi apologizing about the bump, and is otherwise a friendly greeting. It looks to me that Vanheim is mobilizing an actually decently sized army here on Kark, definitely to move northward into this barbarian province here. And he is, in fact, building a palisades up here, as I expected. I, th I think this is an awful place for palisades, especially when this province exists right here, with this huge amount of income and recruitment. Like, the resources aren't that great, but it will soak up resources resources from surrounding provinces, and, you know, Heardmans are really good units that have a really high recruitment cost and don't cost a lot of resources. So this going to end up being a really good Heardman province, and I mean, it should be just fine for Huskarls anyway. But this is like, you know, there's no, nothing special on it as far as like mages go or anything like that. The recruitment is like average. I think the idea might be that he's trying to like secure his northern territory, and you know, it, it's fine, I suppose, from like a uh, mental well-being standpoint, but like, what happens when Ermor takes this province right here? Which I don't think is entirely unlikely. This fortress is going to end up looking like a pom-pom on top of a party hat. But whatever, I mean, it's not that bad. It's more of just that he has, like, really good options for forts elsewhere. Like, I'd say these three provinces are really good. And he's getting his Dwarven Hammers going, so his smithing is going to be a lot more efficient in the future. Uh, Yomi received a message from Shivalba. Shivalba saying that he's going to be ready to attack soon. As he says, next turn he's going to be making Sacred Scorpions. It's just so hard to tell. I get the feeling that Shivalba is on Yomi's side. And I don't know if it's easy for Yomi to tell either, with things that Fomoria has been saying. Uh, Yomi pinged the throne here. We've already seen this pinged. This is the one that has the lore master with the knife of the damned, and a few sages, and then a bunch of random bullshit. A couple of events this turn found an actually pretty good sized pile of gold in Falgoth, and animals are acting really weird in pack woods. People are getting disturbed enough by the amount of snakes and rabbits they're seeing around to say something about it. And Yomi continues to move his armies eastward. I, you know, I really am thinking that Yomi is at least determined to invade Fomoria. Something that I think he should be preparing to do if he does intend to do it by moving his stealthy units 
and it's kind of around Fomoria's cap circle so that he can do an alpha strike all at once. You know, if he managed to take out these provinces while invading these all in one turn, that's going to be very crippling to Fomoria. And then if he wants to, he can re-stealth and avoid losing his raiding parties or combine them with a main assault maybe on Fomoria's capital. <laughs> Building a lab here, which is kind of interesting, maybe just kind of like a forward lab so he could pick up gems and stuff on the way to invading Fomoria. But he's also able to recruit Naminaris here once he gets that lab up. So that might also be the idea. All right, Masamitsu, you're on patrol now. Protect the cave. And Chapalba has received a lengthy message from Yomi. Yomi is proposing a strategy for taking on Fomoria where Shabalba does the alpha strike and distracts Fomoria's armies while Yomi then moves in toward his capital while Fomoria is dealing with Shabalba. Now that's a little bit hard to, uh, I think, convince someone to do as it, it's kind of forcing Shababa to stick his neck out. And then, you know, Shababa's open to Yomi potentially attacking him. And generally, I think it's a little bit easier to coordinate a combined attack on the same turn as it'll give the person that you're allying with more confidence. But that's just my thoughts. I mean, you know, this, this plan might work out if they go for it. He's got his blood hunting working out all right this turn and he's summoning some beast bats. We'll check them out. Definitely not terrible units. Uh, the, the main thing being that they're sacred, but they fly, they're stealthy. A couple more hit points wouldn't be bad because then they regenerate in a new bracket, but that's what they're at. Size three, so they're only going to get two attacks per square. Pretty low protection, though he does have invulnerability on his bless, so they will effectively have 10 in most instances. And fatiguing poison. Actually, quite a bit of it. They definitely put Steph to sleep very quickly. And from his movements, still a little bit difficult to see what his intentions are. Like, he is moving scorpions toward Fomoria's territory, but, like, for all I know, this could be to take the cave, and caves are really important to Shibalba, because that is where he can recruit his uh, Kamazots. But he's also still, you know, he's got, like, a decent army sitting right here. Well, I think this is largely to patrol due to his blood hunting going on in this province. <laughs> He's using the uh, shadow imps to move blood slaves. It's pretty awesome actually. Making his blood hunting more efficient so his blood hunter doesn't have to move back to a lab every now and then. A lot more scorpions coming. And next turn he'll have Conjuration 3 and he can start summoning these sacred scorpions, which he mentioned that he's planning on doing. Because he's sharing that strategy with Yomi and not Fomoria, I'm imagining that in this triangle, Shababa and Yomi will be allying with each other. I think mentioning the messages from Fomoria would not be a bad idea, or at least referencing them in some kind of message for these two to strengthen their bonds if they really are <laughs> allying with each other here. And in Oceania's lands, Fomoria is not Nodding to his previous message, I think this was an offer for a non-aggression pack. Then Shababa's saying Fomoria is doing pretty well, which I, you know, I guess compared to how Shababa's doing. But Fomoria really didn't expand that much. Crazy how Fomoria is perceived as the threat. And Shababa is offering water gems for gold. So looking for a trade agreement there. Shababa desperately needs gold. Oceania did have an expansion battle this turn. Not going to be too many of these expansion battles left in this game. Great flags are almost gone. No. <laughs> He already moved through this. I remember this. This is a province that he already had at one point, and then War Shamblers recaptured it. I love these things. But Big Daddy's come back to put a stop to it. And it looks like the War Shamblers actually do a decent amount of damage to his Afrise, managing to kill half of them and his Iktitar before being wiped out. And I got a pretty cool event here in the Stormy Deep. Shark Knight! Look at that beautiful majestic bastard. I wonder how you form a relationship with a huge ass shark like this. Either way, pretty badass commander here. Good slots and then sitting on a shark. <laughs> shark does a hefty amount of damage with his bite, though it's not very accurate unfortunately. And sure enough, Oceania is moving into this province with his line of Iktitars, so there's going to be a bump here. Not good news for Oceania, I don't think. He did just reach Construction 2. I don't see him making use of it as of yet, and he's site searching with his Pretender now, as well as with some other mages he has moving around. And this is the kind of commander here that I want to slap a bunch of equipment on and use as a thug that I shouldn't slap a bunch of equipment on and use as a thug, you know? <laughs> An amulet of breathing or a shambler skin armor to this thing be so funny. Cruising around on land on top of your gigantic shark. So that has been turn 13 of Antlia. A couple of big bumps next turn. We'll see who comes out on top of them. And I will see you in the next episode.